Today's video is extra special. The holidays are right around the corner. There's gonna be a whole lot of cooking going on. And I've got some recipes that you do not wanna miss. Hey y'all, I'm Valerie and welcome to my kitchen. Today's video is extra special. Not only am I sharing five delicious Thanksgiving dinner recipes, it's part of a huge collab hosted by me this time, and I am so excited. I have an amazing group of friends joining in, and we're all gonna be sharing recipes that you can make for Thanksgiving. There's gonna be a playlist of videos linked in my description box below, so when you're done with this one, be sure to head on over and check out the rest. Okay, y'all, let's go ahead and get started. This cranberry apple casserole turned out to be a big hit. I'm gonna go ahead and make a topping first. In a medium-sized bowl, I added one and a half cups of the quick cooking oats, along with half a cup of brown sugar, half a cup of the all-purpose flour, and half a cup of chopped pecans. And if you want to, you can leave those out and this will still be delicious. I just gave that a quick mix to make sure all that sugar was mixed in and then I added in one stick of melted butter. I'm making kind of a crumble crisp topping here. Now you can go ahead and set this aside. I stuck mine in the refrigerator just so it could harden up a little bit. I thought that would help it to crumble a little better. You'll need two cups of cranberries. I had a 12 ounce bag and I didn't quite use the whole bag. For the apples, I just used Granny Smith. I only used five but I think next time I'm gonna use a couple more. You can leave the peeling on or you can cut it off. I did a little of both. I also added a tablespoon of orange zest, half a cup of brown sugar, and three fourths cup of granulated white sugar. Oh, and I also did just a pinch of salt and a tablespoon of flour. Then you're gonna mix this until all that fruit is covered in that sugar. And I know that's a lot of sugar, but trust me, those cranberries need that sweetness. Okay, I've got that all mixed together. I'm making this in a nine by 13. And you definitely wanna butter that or spray it with a good nonstick spray. And then add in the apple cranberry mixture. And if you're loving this easy recipe so far, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. It really does help out my channel. I spread that out so it was in somewhat of an even layer and I thought a little cinnamon would go good in this, so I added that on. I'd say about a teaspoon or so. I got that topping out of the refrigerator, and you can see it really did solidify in there. But my thinking on this is that I could grab it and kind of crumble it over the top a little easier. But I actually think it would do good either way, so whatever you um, would rather do. Because you see, I quickly gave up with the crumbling and I just dumped it all in. And then you just spread it out. Easy as pie. Not really though. This is a whole lot easier than making a pie. And after you got it all spread out and pretty much got everything covered, this goes into the oven to bake at 350 for anywhere from 45 to 55 minutes. You just pretty much want that fruit to get tender. And if you want the last minute or so, you can turn it on broil and kind of crisp up that top. If you do that though, watch it very closely. You do not want to burn this. This turned out delicious. This is sweet, but it's also tart from the cranberries. We topped ours with vanilla ice cream. If you're tired of the traditional cranberry sauce, you definitely need to try this one. And I had to go in for a second bite because that first one had mostly topping and it just didn't do it justice. Next time, I'll add more apples to this, but it was delicious. This cheesy broccoli rice casserole is a family favorite. I'm starting out in a large skillet here. You'll need a pretty big one. I added three tablespoons of butter and half a diced onion. And I did dice that onion pretty small. I just let it saute until those onions get good and tender. I have a few that don't care for onions, so doing it this way 
they don't really mind them being in there. Now I'm just adding about one and a half tablespoons of minced garlic. I just stirred that around and let it cook for about 30 seconds or so. Now for the broccoli, you can use fresh, but I just used two of the 12 ounce bags of frozen but thawed broccoli florets. And I chopped these into pretty small pieces. And I just let that cook for about 10 minutes or so on about medium low. I just like to give that broccoli a head start on cooking. That way I know it's how we like it when the casserole's done. And for the seasonings, I added 3 fourths teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of pepper, 3 fourths teaspoon each of garlic powder and oregano, half a teaspoon of paprika, and 1 fourth teaspoon of mustard powder. Y'all gotta tell me, what is your number one favorite Thanksgiving side dish? I think it's a tie between this and the macaroni and cheese in my house. After that broccoli was pretty warmed through, I added four ounces of the Velveeta melting cheese, and I cut mine into small cubes. You're also gonna add one can of cream of chicken soup, one fourth cup of sour cream, and three fourths of a cup of milk, and I just used 2%. I just stirred that and let it continue to cook on medium, medium low until that Velveeta cheese was completely melted. And you know, if it's got Velveeta cheese in it, it's gonna be good. There's only a couple more things to add here. Two and a half cups of cooked white rice and about a cup and a half of shredded cheddar cheese. This is also a great way to use up leftover rice. If you have some hanging out in the refrigerator and you're not sure what to do with it, you could also make this casserole the day before. That's a little bit less work you have to do on Thanksgiving day. I'm using a nine by 13 baking dish and I did, uh, don't look like I did. <laughs> You probably should spray that with nonstick spray. I just added in that cheesy broccoli rice mixture. You're just gonna spread that out in there. And you could top this with like a Ritz cracker topping. It would be delicious, I'm sure. But I have several other things that I do the Ritz cracker topping on. So we like to just top this with a cup and a half of shredded cheese. The kids like it better this way, and that way everything's not covered in Ritz crackers. Oh y'all, this has got me thinking about the pineapple casserole. That is one of my favorite side dishes ever. Okay, back to this broccoli rice casserole right quick. I baked it at 350 for about 35 minutes. And I did turn it on broil the last minute just to get that top golden brown. This right here is Lacey's favorite. Can y'all believe that girl does not like macaroni and cheese? But she'll eat a plate of this like there ain't nothing to it. And I don't blame her. We all love this one. I just wanted to take a minute to say, if you're coming over from the playlist, welcome. My name is Valerie and I'm so glad you're here. I post lots and lots of easy recipes on my channel. So if that's something you're interested in, go ahead and hit that subscribe button below. That way you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Okay, let's get back to these recipes. I think you are gonna love this French bread corn pudding casserole. And sorry y'all, I did not know what to call this one. And that's what I came up with. In a very large bowl, add three tablespoons of melted butter. Now, sometimes I'll add the butter to a skillet along with a diced onion and saute that up. Then add it to this big bowl here, but I didn't do that this time. I also added one cup of milk, one cup of heavy cream, four beaten eggs, and I'm using two kinds of corn here. 
I do one can of cream style corn and then two cans of the whole kernel corn drained. And in case you're new here, I always have the recipe either linked or typed out in the description box below. And after I got all that corn in there, I also add one fourth cup of self-rising cornmeal. And now we're about to season this up the savory way. I do a half a teaspoon each of salt, pepper, garlic powder, and onion powder. And then one teaspoon each of thyme, parsley, and Italian seasoning. I also add two teaspoons of sugar, but this does not make it sweet. Now we're getting to the good part. I add in six strips of cooked and crumbled bacon. And I do chop mine up pretty fine. You're just gonna whisk this until it's mostly combined. This is a lot different than the Jiffy corn casserole. It's more of a savory bread pudding. I use a loaf of French bread and I usually weigh it out. I use eight ounces of that. You could use anything similar to this or you could even use brioche. I'm just giving this a little mix here, and I love this spoon, especially for things like this. It's just an old metal spoon, and I have no idea where I got it. Now we're gonna add some cheese. Not too much though, just enough to give it a little extra flavor. I do one third cup of shredded Parmesan cheese and one and a half cups of shredded Colby Jack cheese. You could also use Monterey Jack or whatever your favorite cheese is. You can even add a little more if you want. Now, ideally, this needs to sit about 30 minutes or so. Kind of just cover it up with plastic wrap and let it hang out on the counter for about 30 minutes before you bake it. That way it has time for that bread to absorb the liquid and it holds together a little better. But I had my nephew's football game to go to this night, and I had to get this stuff in the oven. And we were all starving. I just used a 9 by 13 baking dish, and you do want to grease it or spray it with nonstick spray. And I just added all that in. And this makes a very large casserole. This is a 5 quart 9 by 13. I have some that are a little smaller and a little more shallow. So if you feel like it's not gonna fit, you can split it into two. But as long as you use a five quart, you'll be good. I did spread it out kind of evenly in there. And then this bakes at 375 for about 45 minutes. You want it to be set and that top to be golden brown. And y'all, this is absolutely delicious. And not to mention, it'll look pretty on your Thanksgiving table. Now, mine kind of fell apart a little bit because I didn't let it set before I baked it. That bread does need time to soak up that liquid, but it was still so, so good. You can eat it just like this, or some of us in the family prefer this over the cornbread dressing. I have a couple that like to top it with gravy. And you know, that Jiffy corn casserole is really good but it is a little sweet, and sometimes you just want something a little more savory. This is something we never get tired of. We love it, and I really hope you love it too. If you wanna to put together an easy dessert, you have to try this pumpkin spice poke cake. In a large bowl, I added in one box of the pumpkin spice cake mix. You could also use a yellow cake mix if you prefer. Now on this one, I am gonna follow the directions on the back of the box. This one called for water, but I always use milk. It also called for eggs and oil. Now I'm adding one cup of this pure pumpkin puree. Not the pumpkin pie filling, just 100% pure pumpkin. Now mix this until it's well combined. This smells amazing already. 
And that was it for the cake part. I'm just pouring it in a greased 9 by 13 baking dish. This is that same 5 quart 9 by 13. And this is also my favorite nonstick spray, especially for cakes. You're just going to pour all that cake batter in, and then you're going to bake it according to the directions on the back of that cake mix box. And while that's in the oven, or a few minutes before the cake is done, we're going to make up a super quick caramel sauce to pour on top. In a small bowl, I added one can of sweetened condensed milk. And I wanted to get every last drop out of here. You're also going to add in a jar of caramel sauce. The recipe called for a 12.25 ounce jar. This one is 14 ounces, but there's nothing wrong with a little extra caramel. You're just gonna stir this, and I probably should have got my whisk out, but I didn't wanna dirty anything else up, so I just stirred it until it was well combined. Now, as soon as that cake comes out of the oven, you're gonna poke holes all over the top. You can use anything you can find. I'm just using one of the attachments to my mixer. And the more holes you poke in there, the more room you have for that sauce. Now you're going to pour all that sauce on there. And I just use the back of the spoon to try to spread it out and kind of work it down into those holes. And sometimes it tends to run away from the middle and over to the sides. So I like to kind of press down on the middle. That way more of that sauce gets in the middle there. And I didn't end up adding it all. That way I had a couple tablespoons to drizzle over the top. And you do want to let this one sit out and cool completely. You can see how much it soaks up that sauce. You're going to add 8 ounces of the whipped topping. Now before I did this, I was supposed to sprinkle the top of that cake with some Heath toffee bits. But I completely forgot about them even though they were sitting right there beside me. So you should add a half a cup of those Heath toffee bits on before you add the whipped topping. And now we're gonna top it with another. Yes, I said another. Just pretend that I already added half a cup of those Heath toffee bits underneath the whipped topping. So we're topping it with another half cup more. And I took that leftover caramel sauce and drizzled it over the top. And I couldn't help myself. I had to add on more toffee because I missed out on that first layer. You could also use those chocolate toffee bits. I bet those would be really good. Now this goes into the refrigerator covered for at least four hours, or it's really better if you can let it sit overnight. I would suggest making it the day before because it's just even better that way. This was so good, and I'm definitely gonna make it for Thanksgiving. And if you're not a fan of pumpkin pie, don't worry, I'm pretty sure you're gonna love this one. It must be the caramel that just kinda takes it to a whole nother level. We all loved this one. I love sausage balls, but when I seen these stuffing sausage balls, I had to try them. I'm just using a six ounce box of the chicken flavored stuffing, but you can use your favorite here. And I am gonna make it according to the box instructions. It's just butter and water. In a large skillet, I added four tablespoons of butter and one and a half cups of water. And that's what the directions on my box said. So make sure you just follow the instructions on your package. After that butter was completely melted, I added in that stuffing mix. Then you're gonna stir it and make sure all that stuffing soaks up that water. Now you can leave this just how it is, but since this is for Thanksgiving, I wanted to season it up even more. I did some Italian seasoning, some nature seasoning, sage, 
and garlic powder. I just stirred it so all those seasonings were good and mixed in there. Now you're just going to cover it and remove it from the heat and let it sit for about five minutes. And I just pushed mine to the back of the stove top there. And after five minutes, I took the lid off and gave it one last a really good stir. Kind of fluff it up a little bit. Now I'm taking it over to the counter so I can work on the rest. I'm using my really big bowl and you're gonna add in that stuffing. I'm also adding one pound of ground sausage. Also, eight strips of bacon that I cooked, crumbled, and diced up pretty fine there. And three cups of shredded cheddar cheese. Now you're gonna mix it all together until it's well combined. And I'm just getting started with my dough whisk here. I eventually have to switch to my hands. This was my very first time trying these and I found several different variations of sausage balls on Pinterest and I can't wait to try them all. And you'll know when you have it all mixed together really good you can shape it into a ball and it'll stick together. And this one was a little too big here. So you can just kind of play around with the size that you want, but I ended up tearing that one in half. You're gonna need a sheet pan for these. And this does make a lot, but I managed to fit them all on this one pan. And I use about a one and a half tablespoon size cookie scoop. That way I know I get them all the same size I just scoop out some of that mixture and roll it between my hands just to smooth it out and then place it on that cookie sheet. And if you want, you can put a layer of parchment paper down. That does kind of help to soak up some of that grease. These go into the oven to bake at 350 for about 25 minutes. Here they are out of the oven. And that pan does end up with quite a bit of grease on it. I don't like the sausage balls to just sit on there with that. So as soon as I take them out of the oven, I transfer them to a paper towel line tray. Making these made my house smell like Thanksgiving. I feel like they were a little more dense than a regular sausage ball, but I love the flavor. They were really, really good. And I made some cranberry dipping sauce to go with them. And it's just one cup of canned cranberry sauce and one fourth cup of orange juice. Bring it to a simmer in a saucepan, whisk it until it's well combined, and then it's ready to go. This makes the best little Thanksgiving appetizer. And I have to tell you, we devoured these. I really hope you enjoyed this video. You may also like these. Don't forget to check out that playlist below for lots of easy dinner recipes, and I will see you in the next one.